Justin, welcome to the show. Awesome. Yeah, appreciate you having me on, Jonathan. Of course, of course. Well, we have an awesome mutual friend, Andrew Wright, and they are currently in the middle of an, an amazing season. And I'm not surprised at all just basing the information that you know we share through one another and, and just knowing him as a coach, and I think he does an absolutely fantastic job. But he recommended you, which, I, which is high regards because uh, if he recommends anybody, I'm sure that they're going to be awesome. So I'm ready to get excited to get started and ready to get going. Yeah, me too. And yeah, talk about Andrew Wright. Talk about what he's built there at, at University of Charleston. Yeah, just an incredible job. And actually, right before we hopped on, I, I wished him good luck. I think mm-hmm. they're playing today, actually, Friday, Saturday. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And I, again, by the time that people listen to this, there will be, hopefully, they will have won the whole thing. <laughs> so yeah. uh, looking back, I, I guess we can look back at it and laugh. But uh, the guests want to get to know you a little bit. So give us a short snapshot of why you decided to get into coaching. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, First, let's let's start here. Um, I played for Andrew Wright, um, and I was one of those players that like tried everything to maximize kind of my abilities, and it just it just never worked out. Um, I think at looking back, um, I almost did too much. Um, tried everything, did everything, um, and that's kind of what ended up hurting and 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 ending my career. Um, and my the reason why I got into coaching was to help those players that kind of have that same desire and that same goal to keep pushing further and further and maximizing their abilities um, to help those kinds of players and, and help them reach their goals. Cause I never got to reach mine as a player. Okay. Um, so that's kind of why, why I got into coaching and, and the people aspect is something that we get, we, we as coaches overlook a lot mm-hmm. um, and helping, helping people grow um, is, is a huge, huge aspect of coaching. Well, it seems like that's a huge aspect of what you guys are doing with the twins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys have had Tanner on previously mm-hmm. and I know you have uh Fotsy coming up as well. Or mm-hmm. again, when this airs, you might've already had Fotsy on here. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's phenomenal what the twins are doing and what, uh, Jeremy Zoll and Alex Hassan and Thad Levine and Derek Falvey have all kind of put together, mm-hmm. um, uh, from the top down. It's, mm-hmm. it's incredible. It's an incredible time to be a part of the twins organization. Definitely. And it seems like not too long ago, the twins were kind of one of the, teams that were so far behind everybody else and so but that changed in the last like two or three years i feel like uh yeah i would say um the old regime had kind of been phasing in some newer stuff but again as soon as jeremy's old took over um hired a bunch of college coaches and uh i was kind of in that first wave lucky enough to be uh to get that email from from jeremy Mm -hmm. and uh be introduced with this this new kind of uh era of professional baseball no i love that and I love that that you guys are being so progressive, and it, it's a it's an organization that doesn't have a huge budget, but you guys are spending a ton of money on player development, and I, obviously you're seeing the dividends of that this season. Yeah, yeah, it's been it's been an incredible ride, and uh, and you'll come to find out kind of my philosophies is very similar with the what what the Twins are doing now. We're just maximizing what players already do extremely extremely well. I love that. So let's just go ahead and and go into uh, the off season. I, I think that. You know, this will air in July, and so we're we as coaches are well, at least high school and college coaches, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do in the off season, and it's an it's an exciting time because we're looking for things that we did well, and we're looking mm-hmm. for things that we can always add to our toolbox, at least yep. the good ones. And so, what are some something that always comes up is how can I get better, and how can I develop each individual player within the team setting better, and so. You being a guy who gets the new players all the time in and out, what are some different ways that you found successfully to be able to do that? So when when you're trying to maximize individuals within a team setting, it starts there. It starts kind of understanding the individual, understanding what they already do exceptionally well, and kind of leveraging that ability to maximize what your team does. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's the great thing about baseball. It's very much a team sport. One, There's no... Mike Trout's not going to win your World Series by himself, whereas right. other sports can't. Um, you look at the NBA, for example. Mm-hmm. One superstar can, like LeBron James, can take the Cavs as far as they can possibly go. Right. Um, baseball is not that way. It's about leveraging the team's abilities to maximize defensive abilities, offensive abilities, all that kind of fun stuff. And you've seen, essentially, the Houston Astros do that over the last three or four years. Right. They haven't. They don't have necessarily. Yeah, they got a. I, they've got a couple of superstars, but they're homegrown superstars. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've got three, four or five of them across the field at, at any given point. Sure. 
Um, so it really comes down to understanding what the individual does well. Um, and that's kind of like where, uh, where the assessments come in, um, the technology comes in. Okay, what does this guy do extremely well and how can I leverage that and make it that much better? Sure. Well, no, I, I think that that's something that just a few years ago, we, without the technology, it was really hard to put a, put a pinpoint on what this player did well. Because now you can look at spin rate and you can look at, yeah. okay, how, what is his swing and miss pitch and not just guess. So it's taken a yeah. lot of the guesswork out of it. Yes, very much so. Well, very much so. And you mentioned the screen. So for, our, again, listening, the guys that are listening are probably not going to be certified, most of them anyways. But if they wanted to just look for a couple of things that a, a decent amount of their players are doing, you know, where would they start? Um, so first of all, I need to, I need to kind of, yeah, I've been lucky enough with the twins to be with, uh, a couple really good, um, athletic trainers and, and, uh, weight, weight staff, physical sure. or strength conditioning staff. Uh, so Travis Kuhn guy that's interned for Cressy for multiple years. Um, he will be a big league strength and, and strength and conditioning guy at some point. Um, young guy, extremely bright. Um, he kind of, introduced me to this world last year and understanding how the body moves and and the physical limitations that come up uh, why certain guys can't do certain things why they can't throw certain pitches why they what their body is doing at a highly a high speed and highly ballistic level is going to determine a lot of what they're able to produce mm -hmm. um so we first need to understand that um when i look at assessing players and what they're good at and what they're bad at i look at kind of four things um i look at proprioceptive that's the that's the part that us as coaches really hone in okay the pitching stuff the what's their body doing in space what's their hand doing in space but there's also the mobility standpoint the stability standpoint as well as the mental um and we as coaches like to go to what we know um and that's that's that can be a problem sometimes we might actually be putting our players in into bad situations um so like there are these these kind of general and standard physical assessments that we can all be run through, mm -hmm. um, including like, uh, I'm a big proponent of TPI and on base U, um, phenomenal, phenomenal course that I think everybody should have access to and everybody should do. Um, they give you a simple and digestible way to look, look at your athlete and the way they're moving and why they're doing the things they do. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as FMS and FRC and, and all those other three letter acronyms. Sure. Um, but yeah, no, I think that is the, the key to this whole thing is understanding that it's not just proprioceptive. It's not just stability. It's not just mobility. It is a, um, an, a, a whole system that works together. And, and the interplay between those things is where you can maximize kind of those players values. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned proprioception because, uh, this whole week we've been talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, we've been talking about some different things that we see with our players doing. Our season just ended. So okay, we're, gotcha. we're hitting the reset button and we're moving on to uh, next year. And we're just trying to put players where we think that we can maximize their abilities. And we've got a couple of guys who it, it's interesting because we had a conversation just about hand-eye coordination and proprioception okay. and your body moving in space. And so we've got a couple that can, they can really hit, but they they have terrible hands and it looks like okay. the ball almost just jumps up on them and so they're and i'll try to get this on video but okay. uh guys with you know with terrible proprioception or terrible you know hand-eye coordination whatever you want to call it uh it seems like the ball just gets on them or they have to go <laughs> get it and the okay. guys that yeah. are really good at a high level they they know exactly where it's coming they know and, and it looks just so much softer but uh, how do we how do we fix that? Because uh, you know, listening to a to Rob Gray's podcast on it a couple of weeks ago, he talked about it has to be very very sports specific, and not just like the tossing of balls and doing all of this different stuff. So that's something that that you see a lot on social media, and I'm sure it does help hand eye coordination, but it's not specific enough to help with a specific task. And so what yeah. are your thoughts on that? I know it's a long story short, but essentially we have a couple of players who can hit and they look really comfortable in the box and they don't, you know, they don't look like they're getting the, just like they look at other positions. And it's so weird because the ball, the ball is moving to them constantly and it's two different activities, but I'm just curious your thoughts on, you know, why that is and then how we can help with them defensively. Yeah. So, uh, 
<laughs> so I'm going to steal uh, Fatsy's line. Right? Uh-huh. And I'm sure he's going to bring it up in his his podcast at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, his job, essentially, in the way he views hitting is to – I'm going to put you in the best position to see the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's what that's what we as humans do. We want to see. We want to visualize things. Um, and a lot of the times, even in the pitching motion, you're going to find guys getting bad positions to see where they're trying to throw the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, especially guys that have or, or want the intent to throw very hard. They're going to sacrifice um, strikeability because they can't keep their eyes on target to throw harder and create more separation. Sure. Um, so I think that's a huge aspect that we overlook a lot is like understanding that they're trying, like we need to be in a better situation to see what we're trying to do. Cause again, as we, as humans, where our eyes go, our head goes, our head goes, our body goes, mm-hmm. um, we, and, and what, like 70% of our brain is, is optical power. Mm-hmm. Um, we're trying to see. Um, so I think that is a huge, huge aspect that we kind of gets overlooked a lot like what is our eye yeah. what's our head doing where are our eyes doing where is our neck able to get into a position to consistently maximize what the rest of the body is doing so do you um, think, do you think for the proprioception aspect do you think it really has to be specific to the task or are there some different ways because a, a couple of years ago i you know threw out the idea of doing some different hand-eye coordination in warm-ups you know like tossing okay. balls back and forth and, and you see that and it just never, for one reason or another, got accomplished. And then after listen, again listening to Rob Gray's uh, yeah. podcast, which is phenomenal, and anyone he does a great into, job. Yeah, he's he's awesome. And he just talked about it. It helps a little bit, but it doesn't help as much as sports specific stuff. So the conversation between the coaches and I were, well, how do we make it more sports specific other than literally hitting them a thousand ground balls? And yeah, I, I mean, it, it, is the, are those your thoughts as well? Uh from 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 working with high level infield guys, mm-hmm. um, and developing that. I think it has to be sports specific. I think there's, um, very rarely, especially in the baseball, baseball realm, are there other sports and other movements that are very similar? Um, like obviously you got the side to side in basketball and, mm-hmm. and all that kind of fun stuff. But yeah, with, especially with a sport like baseball, there's not too much commonality in terms of movements. Um, so I would say, yes, it needs to be more sports specific. It's purely a reps thing. Um, and I think that's one thing that we, especially like I'm from Canada, so I can say in North America, we don't do a very good job of is, is yeah. getting, getting reps where I think in Latin America and, and, um, other parts of the world, it's, it, they're getting a lot of reps all the time. Mm-hmm. They're practicing more than they're playing. And that's the opposite here. Yeah, no, that, that makes complete sense. And, uh, that's a soapbox that, that I won't get into <laughs> today, but, <laughs> let's, talk, let's talk about the pitching aspect. And, you know, again, for our listeners, we have a, an array of people from youth level to pro ball. And just give us a, a, an idea of, especially you coming into a new season, or if you get a bunch of new players, you're going to get sent video. What exactly are you looking for? Um, so again, the first place I'm going is I'm going to the strength coach coaching the athletic trainer. Hey, what are these guys able to do? What positions can they get and where are the limitations? That's good. Um, because that's going to direct a lot of what I'm looking at um, and looking at in the video. Um, the biggest thing for me is I like to watch the energy transfer. Mm-hmm. Okay. How is the energy being moved? First of all, collected and then moved down the mound. Um, so it starts with the back foot. Okay. Are we loading into our back hook, back hip? Are we able to stay in the ground as long as possible and transfer and move our energy down the mound efficiently, um, kind of with the center of mass? Okay. And then what is that front foot doing when we land? Okay. Are we moving forward? Are we able to drive back and, and drive that, that hip back into the pelvis and then send the energy continuing up the chain? Um, sure. So, yeah, I really focus on where is the energy going and how is it being transferred? Because um, that's going to dictate a lot about what kind of the end result is. Um, and I think that's, uh, again, that physical assessment and understanding where that, where the limitations are is huge mm-hmm. when watching that video, because again, our, my job as a, as a pitching coach, the first place I want to go is pitching drills. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Let's put them on, on this, this implement, or let's do this drill or sure. let's, but if he physically cannot stay in this position, then we got other problems to deal with. It's not a proprioceptive issue. It's not, he can't stay in this position it's literally he doesn't have the mobility or the stability to stay in that position right um or strength we've had or our strength yeah yeah so we've had like even situations arise this year i'll i'll, I'll run a guy through and i'll see something i'll run through a quick assessment just to make sure i'm what my eyes are seeing 
is lining up with kind of what his physical assessment says. And then we'll, I'll send him right to the trainer. Hey, he needs, he needs more calf mobility right now because he can't stay in, in, in dorsi. He can't get into dorsi flexion and actually ride his, his, his bottom half down. Mm-hmm. Um, so just, just different things like that. But yeah, very much like I like to look at the energy transfer. What's the energy doing? Okay. What's the front foot doing? Um, cause we all know, and we've all read enough driveline articles and enough studies that really it's velocity into your front leg. That's mm-hmm. that, that creates arm speed and velocity. Um, so we need to make sure we're maximizing that energy transfer. Um, and, and we're lucky enough to have, uh, some, some really cool technology, um, that we can see this on, on different levels, um, that again, a lot of your readers probably don't, or a lot of your listeners probably don't have access to, but, mm-hmm. um, follow the energy, follow where it's going, see where the deficiencies lie there. Um, you don't need Edgertronic videos. Yeah. That's awesome to have, but you can use your iPhone. The, these phones are powerful enough that you're going to see 90% of what you need to see. Um, then you get the thousand frames per second. They can really see some cool stuff. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And so what does that conversation look like between you and the player? Because you not only got different players of different ages, but different backgrounds speaking different languages. And I'm sure that's something that you've had to learn in the process of going about this. But what does that look like? And what is your advice for people who are dealing with similar situations? Um, just be honest with them. I think, I think especially this generation, the generation, um, and also currently at the double A level, these, these are grown men. Um, we're dealing with grown men that have families and, uh, um, you need to be honest with them. Hey, I don't have all the answers. This is what my eyes are telling me. This is what this assessment is telling me. You're in a bad position. We need to get in a better one. Um, what you're trying to do and what you're trying to, we're trying to maximize, you're not able to do because you're in these bad positions. Right. Um, and, and I think understanding that and being honest with the player, like, Hey, this is not just me as your pitching coach. This is me as your pitching coach our strength trainer, our athletic trainer. Okay. We're a team. Um, and, and we're going to assess you from all directions to make sure you're doing what you need to do. And I think at the end of the day, that's what TPI is introduced to, to both golf and baseball at such a great and high level that like it's, it's organizations and, and people that aren't doing that is it's very, very flawed. Right. Right. No, I like that. And, and I like that you're taking in part them personally, which I think is, is something that, you know, looking back in my career, I had some different coaches who were like, you need to do this. And then yeah. w- my immediate reaction is why, you know, why do I need to do yeah. this? And, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, growing up, it's, I am a millennial, but at, at the end of, you know, the millennials, it's now getting into, okay, now we can start asking those questions of why rather than before that it was just like, okay, coach, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then yeah. moving on. But and I, again, you've got to take into account the player and we've got to take into account what they're feeling, what they're seeing, what was going on. And, and I think that all of those are big pieces to the puzzle of what we're trying to do, which is maximize their potential as a baseball player. But are, so, yep. are there different, uh, are there some different problems that you see commonly with, uh, not just pro ball guys, but you don't work with just pro ball guys anyways, but are some, there are some different things that you're seeing on a consistent basis that you could say, uh, there's, you know, not everyone does this, but here are some common problems for, you know, Joe pitching coach who may not have the extent of knowledge that you do, but here are some things to look for. I'm, uh, and this is, this has kind of come up in the last three or four months. Um, I, again, having access to hydrotronic video, um, kind of exposed this at a level I'd never seen it before. I think, and this might be a little drastic, but I think probably 90% of pitchers are overstriding. Okay. Um, again, I'm relatively the same age as a lot of the guys I'm coaching. Um, and I was raised in the Linscom era where you get down the mound, you want to overstride, you want to get 110 and 10% of your body length. And, and Kyle Bodie and Driveline have done a great job of kind of uh, exposing that and saying, that's mm-hmm. first of all, that's not true. Sure. Um, but I think generally the the – the population of pitchers overstrides. That's the first place I like to look at. Okay. Um, because we all, again, we all believe that we need to stride even 90% of our body length. Mm-hmm. I think that depends a lot on our hip flexibility, our ham, our hamstring length. Um, and that changes on a daily basis. Also, like if we just get off a bus, your stride length's not going to be the same as if you've been at home for 10 days and you've yeah. been, you're loose and you're relaxed and, um, you've been able to get that, that movement prep and that daily work in. Um, I think that is kind of a, a common area that not a lot of people really look at. 
Um, because if, again, if that energy transfer isn't efficient, um, there's going to be some huge issues that arise on the, on the top end, um, where guys get stuck or, or the arms late or early rotation or whatever you may have. If, if, if there's a lack of energy transfer, um, there's, there's going to be some issues. Um, and I think I, like the best way I can, uh, I can, I can put it is you see a lot of guys, um, essentially both feet are off the ground at the same time. Hmm. There's no weight bearing feet in the ground. Okay. Okay. Imagine doing a lunge where you're actually jumping. You say you got a hundred, 135 pounds on your back and you're doing a lunge, but at some point, both your feet are off the ground. There's no hmm. weight actually in the ground. How, what hmm. kind of, are you, are you going to be able to transfer and control that energy? Probably not. Right. Um, so that's, that's, <laughs> we've got a couple guys in our organization that people have historically said like are, are short striders. Oh, they, they, but again, looking at the physical assessment, you can see why they're short striders and how they're actually maximizing their efficiency at moving the ball. Um, and we've got a couple here in, here in Pensacola. And I know of one that I had for sure last year and the kid throws a hundred miles per hour. And you're like, how, how does he do that? And it's because he understands his limitations and he looks like he's short striding, but no, it's, he's maximizing what his lower half can do. Sure. I really like that a lot. And I'm actually going to on base you, uh, in oh, a couple of days and oh, wow. nice. so, yeah, I'm excited about it. I'll be there in Houston. And one thing that, that uh, I've has really puzzled me is, so we get these kids, we don't have them all day like you do. And they're in the weight room three days a week so they can do their mobility, stability stuff in there, their, mm -hmm. uh, their corrections. And yep. just how do we, what is your advice on how I can or how we can as a community get them better at doing that? Something else that was mentioned was after the warm up, give them five minutes to do their individual corrections, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I thought was really good. And they can do them in the weight room before they get started. But what's your advice on that? And, you know, that's just something that we as a staff have been talking about is, okay, now we can identify what they're, what they need to fix. But where in the course of, of practice are they going to be able to do it? Because we can give them homework, which is good, yeah. and maybe some of them will do it. But for the most part, we would like to have our eyes on them just so we can help them through that process. Yeah, I think you mandate it kind of like right before throwing, mm -hmm. uh, right before your band work, right before uh, – like you can even do a prior stretch. Okay. Um, when I, last year in, when we were in Cedar Rapids, we would, we would almost mandate it. Um, it was like, hey, before we go play catch and go stretch, you're going to go into the weight room. We're going to do our five minutes of moon prep. Okay. Um, obviously, now dealing with with older players and um, hey, here's what we strongly suggest you doing. And we have them if they are going to do it. And, and again, it's an organizational push for them to do it. Um, we have them do it prior to uh, prior to going out for stretch, prior mm -hmm. to going out for catch play. This is and, and it's helped. It helps them understand, like, hey, this is your deficiency. This is what we're trying to do on the pitching end, and this is why you can't do it. Okay. Um, so let's let's go work on that. Um, again, if you can't throw a changeup, it's probably because you can't get into proper extension of your arm. So let's let's work on the things that are going to help you get there. Sure. Um, and understanding that kind of aspect of it, um, I think that's where you get your real buy-in. It's like, hey, this is going to help you on the back end. You you worry strictly about your performance, okay? But this is going to help your performance. Right. No, I like that a lot. And another thing that, that has been really on my mind lately is we have a, you know, a staff of seven on, and oh, which, wow. which is not, which is good, but just yeah. it's from uh, varsity two and two JV teams. And oh, we, wow. okay. we've been talking about the importance <laughs> of communication between all of the levels to make sure we're doing all of the, all of the stuff that we need to be doing. And once, you know, we're playing five days a week, once the spring hits and we don't see each other all the time. And so varsity coaches aren't seeing the JV coaches and, and so on and so forth. And you guys have a similar problem where you, you know, <laughs> it, it comes from the top down. But how are you guys and how, how, are, how is the, the communication system structured in a way that, you know, like Wes Johnson has, has an idea of, of the guys that you have. And so everything yeah. is from the top down. I'm sure you guys communicate consistently, but for the coaches in a similar situation for us, what are some ways that you guys have been able to do that consistently? Um, well, you need to have, first of all, you need to have kind of all your information in one and your ability to communicate in one kind of central location. Okay. Um, and I know, again, I can steal this from coach, Wright. He does a phenomenal job with his, with his staff, mm -hmm. um, of, of essentially having everything on a Google drive. Okay. Um, so they can, everybody can see anything at any point as well as players, players have access to that Google drive as well. Um, so they can see the schedule, they can see practice plan, they can see 
everything and they can all communicate within that kind of realm. Um, I think that's, that's huge. Um, but I think you kind of hit it on the head right there is like the, the twins right now are in a place where like, there is no, yeah, Wes Johnson is in the big leagues and I'm in double a, and then there's the guys down in the GCL and extended, Mm -hmm. but the level of communication is flat. Like there's not hierarchical. It's flat. If I need to reach out to Wes and Hef and ask them a question, there's no walls. There's no borders. They're like, hey, That's no, awesome. don't talk to that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a phenomenal situation to be a part of because uh, that's very, very rare in sure. today's world. Um, that's very rare. Um, so it's exciting to, to learn from these guys and, and learn from somebody like Wes, who's who's doing an incredible job. Obviously, at the big league level, where he's he's killing it, um, and kind of kind of keep that going. But that starts from a like a, a central aspect that it needs to be like it's open. The communication waves are open. Anybody can communicate with anybody at any time. There's no hier- hierarchical kind of borders, um, and that's that's huge. That's a huge aspect of, of of the communication piece. Right. No, I'm I'm right there with you. And the reason I think that is is so that the player isn't. You know, sometimes they need to hear a different voice or a different mm-hmm. way to say something. Yes. <laughs> but if it's conflicting between you know this coach and this coach, it's really hard for them to decide what is right. And I'm sure that situation has come up with everybody in the past of where X hitting coach told me this or, hey, Mm -hmm. I heard you say this and then this person said this. And I think in the end it only helps the player with being able to communicate with everybody that they work with or at least everybody that's willing to. Yep. Yeah, I think it's – and again, I think uh, like a Google Drive provides a high school coach, even even a lower-level college coach, the ability to keep that kind of information in a central location where everybody can see it, everybody can get updates – uh, on what was said and what what is a what is a five second note in in the grand scheme of things if it's going to really help in your player development from from a you see them for four years essentially from a vars or a junior varsity level or a uh, a freshman team all the way up to okay let's go win a let's go win a Oklahoma State championship your senior year yeah, that'd be awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> so a, yeah. another thing that I think plagues a lot of pitching coaches as is you mentioned that we obviously want to train velocity and I think there's a lot of research out about how to do that and mm-hmm. you mentioned one of the one of the guys on the forefront which is uh, the, the driveline guys Mike and Kyle and and they do a phenomenal job but something that I don't think gets enough attention is how do we develop command because mm-hmm. I get a lot of I ask this a lot, and it all comes back to being able to play catch and probably that proprioception piece that you were talking about and being able to fill your body. But, you know, I just want to know, say you have a guy that throws 100, how are you yeah. going to help him develop the command enough to at least compete in the strike zone? So that's, again, that's kind of the, the fun the fun part of our oh, job yeah. um, because it, it takes a lot of experimentation because, again, these guys all have different deficiencies. Mm-hmm. Um why, first of all, why isn't he throwing strikes? That's kind of the main goal. Okay, again, you can go into the mobility, stability, proprioceptive, or mental. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, is it he physically can't get into the positions? He can't maintain the positions. He literally cannot feel his hand in space, or he's just afraid of contact or whatever. So about it's about truly understand why he's un- unable to to throw those strikes. Um, the after we've assessed all that, we've realized, okay, it is a proprioceptive issue. Um, I'm very big on con- uh, constraint-based training, um, understanding and manipulating the organism, the task, and the environment. Um, so, and, and really when we do this, we focus more on the task and the environment. And the task is essentially changing the rules of the game. Okay, let's play a different game. It's not catch play anymore. It's something else. Okay. Um, and then also manipulating the environment through different implements, through um, go, throwing up a hill, throwing down a hill, throwing all like like you can you can kind of get very very creative. Um, and the goal is ultimately to to uh, what's the what's the word I'm looking for? The the goal is to feed the flaw. That's okay. kind of what we're looking to uh, to do to really help them understand and feel what the flaw is and overcorrect it. Um, because if you're if you're doing something on one end of the spectrum when we feed the flaw and you're able to correct it, okay, we're going to hopefully meet somewhere in the middle mm-hmm. um, when we when we adjust those both those tasks and those those uh, those environmental constraints. Okay, I like that. And for our listeners who don't know you real well, you are lefty. 
I am left-handed. Yes, and, and so something that has plagued uh, our base, our our game of baseball since the beginning of time is how do we teach lefty pick moves? Because they either have a really good one, or it, they have a terrible one, and it's mm-hmm. usually not anywhere in between. So, what are you? What's your advice on the pitching coaches who are listening, who are like, yes, please, please tell me how to teach a lefty pick move because I'm not left-handed, or I am left-handed and I have a terrible one. So, what's your advice on that? So, yeah. So for me, um, again, like, like I, uh, uh, Andrew Wright, um, had, has a great move. Mm-hmm. Me, I'm a lefty that didn't have the, the best move. Um, <laughs> but he taught me a lot about how to teach him. Okay. Um, so the, the, for me, um, and again, through at my time at Radford, um, I got to fill a lot of roles. Um, when I'm looking at a lefty, the first place I'm going is their foot. Okay. okay. Is their foot giving away when they're picking? Cause a lot of lefties is when they're coming over, you see toes up, Okay, when they're going home, toes down for whatever reason. Um, I could not tell you why that happens um, and the mechanics of it, but that's kind of the general general theme. General theme. So, first of all, okay, are we keeping our full foot in the ground? Are we driving at that 45? Um, our chin and our shoulder still need to be maintaining kind of towards the plate. Um, and then, and this is a coach rightism. Okay, he wants kind of a, a, a lazy look. Um, over over to first base because um, you see a lot of lefties they'll hear they're on you okay then they're home and then they're pick and he kind of wants here okay we're on you okay pick up home go and then lazy look over to first base and you're good to go that kind of quick head turn is what sell is what kind of a lot of base runners cue off of sure um and again not the greatest teacher at this but i think that drive at 45 is huge while keeping that head and that shoulder kind of that chin and that shoulder maintaining its their drive towards home plate until the, la- the very last second. Um, that's that's a big part for me. So with the lazy look, you're talking about literally looking to first, looking at home, and then mm-hmm. picking back? Because the, the old lefty truism is if they're looking at you, they're going home. And if they're looking at yeah. home, where they, they're coming to first base. So that ca- yeah. kind of gives that away a little bit? A little bit, yeah. And that, that kind of like slow head turn instead of the snap, a lot mm-hmm. of, again, human eyes are based off of they want to see those quick, quick movements right um that kind of lazy slower look um tends to really kind of first of all you need to see where you're throwing um you can teach the no look pick i i was taught that at in junior college at, at uh, noc enid but uh-huh. um under under radon radon leading taught me that um but that lazy look first of all helps the pitcher pick up their target again um as well as kind of doesn't cue or, or give that that base runner that head that that quick head snap that sure. might might tip them off a little bit, but definitely that drive at 45. Um, and again, keeping that front shoulder and that front, that, that chin kind of directionally towards home until the very last second. Right. Those are, those are two or three things that are very, very key for me. Perfect. I like that a lot. And that's something that, you know, as a first base coach, you're, you're looking for those things. Are the shoulders coming over here? Are they looking to, are they looking at home, uh, in the yeah. toes thing? I, I've heard that before. And that's something that, that is a giveaway too. And no, nah, it's just, I, for any lefties that are listening, if, the, if you don't have a good pick move, please work on it because it is such <laughs> it is such a, a a good thing to have, and it's something that is just built into ha- being a lefty. That's something that, that you really yep. need to work on. And I'm sure that's something, if, if you could go back, that would be something that it only helps you in the long run because no doubt. If, if you have a good pick, then guys are literally – so we, so I've, I've played with a guy from Elk City, Oklahoma. His name was Brett Davis. Okay. The filthiest pick move I've ever, because he, he paused at the time that he was coming down. So he, okay. he lifted his foot up and then he would almost pause and then go home. And he would, he, he picked a guy off who was supposed to be standing on first base. Okay. Yeah. So it's just one of those things that's like, that is such a weapon because then they're not even getting leads. They're literally taking yeah. a foot off of first base, but Anyway, yeah. so so he was a good well, one, pitched at OSU, and then it was called a balk for in the Big 12, so he okay, couldn't do it gotcha. anymore, but that, that should tell you a lot. What were you going to say? I've had I've had a lot of success with left-handers doing uh, slide step moves as well. I've mm-hmm. um, okay. had a lot of success with that. So something might, like if you can't do a traditional one, okay, kind of just go right to a slide step. Mm-hmm. But the problem with that is you've got to start mixing slide steps as a pitcher. Right. Um, but yeah, I've had three or four lefties that have had phenomenal moves, and it is a kind of knee knock slide step move where essentially you're drawing a J with that front foot, okay. where it goes kind of out and around instead of directly at that 45. Hmm. I like that, and you've still been able to at least keep runners close because you're quick to the plate. 
yeah, you're quick to the plate still. And, uh, and like the old truism that like, Oh, lefties can be slower is, is false because right. there's no, there's no read left handers anymore. It's mm-hmm. not a, nobody teaches that anymore. So runners are going off first movement as soon as they say delayed under that front foot. So the, again, the old truism that lefties can be one, four, one, five is, is false. They actually kind of need to be quicker because first movement runners are going, if they are going, because nobody's read picking anymore. Nobody's hanging at the top to see, okay, is this guy going? No, I can pitch. (laughs) So, right. Yeah. And there's a reason for that too. (laughs) Yeah, very much so. So whenever we're talking about setting up a routine for pitchers, and again, you've got guys who probably have their mindset on how they like to get ready and how that what they like to do pre post throwing because it's, it's a business, it's their job. And if yep. if there was a guy who a younger guy who was like, hey Justin, what are some different ways uh, that can help me get ready for the week? Can you help me plan it out? What were what are some what are some different things that you really like, you know, pre post, pre throwing, post throwing, and just if we're set, let's do a starter because it would be a whole lot easier. But if yep. just kind of take us through a week of what a week would look like with uh, a pitcher if he came and asked, you know, what 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 can you do to help me with my routine? Um, so again, at first it 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 comes to understanding. Okay, what is what kind of athlete are they? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a podcast a while back. It was Jaeger, Cressy, Body, um, and they were talking about the different um, physiologies of of pitchers. Like mm-hmm. there's guys that can pick up a ball and throw. 95 right off the bat and sure. there's guys that like like trevor bowers one he has to constantly throw and constantly build up power so building those guys programs and understanding what their weeks are going to look like and i'm going to go off a seven day week it's just like a similar to a college one sure. um because re- again we're your audience is is college and and uh high school coaches so let's let's stick with that kind of audience um so building off that seven day program it depends on the physiology of the athlete um the biggest thing we we don't look at enough of, um, and I think we've started to do a very good job in general uh, here with the twins is understanding kind of, um, rest and recovery and the CNS, the, the central nervous system and how, how we actually need that rest over a three, four or five month period. Um, you need like, so there's, there's sympathetic nervous system and there's parasympathetic. Okay. Sympathetic is the fight or flight. Parasympathetic is the rest and digest. We need to make sure our athletes in that seven-day period are getting enough of that parasympathetic setting. They're not constantly turned on because that's going to exhaust their – just exhaust them, period. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's something – looking back at what I would change at Radford was making sure we're getting enough of that parasympathetic. Okay. Um, and and that, that, that involves understanding, okay, are we lifting heavy today? When are we throwing heavy? When are we going to take a couple – couple more lighter days to make sure we're just moving. We're still getting that active recovery. Um, and we're out of that, that sympathetic nervous system. Um, so again, understanding kind of how we schedule our week out, um, in terms of rest, rest and digest and, and the, the nervous system, and then further understanding what kind of physiology are we, are we a guy that can pick up and throw 95 or are we a guy that needs to kind of build up and, and make sure we're doing our long toss consistently. So traditionally, we we mostly know that pitchers run a lot and Mm -hmm. so you said looking back there were some things that you would change are there any things well let's talk about the things that you would change but let's also talk about some things that people do traditionally and i I think for the most part we've got out of running pools but what are (laughs) what are some things that we do as coaches traditionally with pitchers that maybe we need to take a second look and go "Ah, maybe this isn't perfect for every guy that that i've got on my team um, again, the first, the first thing I would go to is running pulls. Uh, that's, I, I was, I was guilty of it. Um, up until about three years ago, there'd be, okay, you threw the day before your next day, you have a 20, 25 minute run mm-hmm. just to flush the system. There's, there's better ways to do that. There's, uh, better ways to make sure our athletes are recovering. Um, at, at, at Radford, we had access to a lot of Hills, obviously being in Southwestern Virginia, um, there's a lot of hills, a lot of mountains. So we did a lot of sprint training, um, to make sure we're in that power position, that driving position, that 10 second window where we're going to go hard and stop rest and recover mm-hmm. and then get our heart rate back down and go again. Um, that, that part of, of it is not looked at enough. Um, understanding how we can incorporate that quick twitch into our weekly, weekly training. Um, what are some other things? Um, 
really. Uh, I, within the last few years, um, weighted balls, understanding when to use them, when understanding how to use them, understanding which drills to use on specific days. Um, that's huge. Um, and understanding that the, the, essentially the heavier the implement, the safer you are, um, hmm. right. in terms of making sure we're activating the right muscles. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I will be honest, I think guys like, again, Cressy and body and Jaeger and all those guys do a phenomenal job of in uh, educating people on how to prepare the body to throw us as coaches generally don't give our athletes enough time to prepare their body to throw. Um, and that can be incorporated within the week like that. That needs to be understood. Um, hey, if you're going long toss today and you're going max effort pull downs coming in, we need to make sure we spend 10 to 15 minutes on that program to getting our body ready to throw. Mm-hmm. Um, throwing should be the easy part. Right. Okay, getting our body warm and ready and sweating. That's that's that happens before throwing. OK, so a little bit of an easier question for you. For the most part, whenever they're done throwing for the day, say you've got a starter and he just threw six innings, are, are you doing anything after he throws that night, or are you going straight to rest? Um, we're going straight to rest. Okay. Um, that arm and that shoulder is, is completely built, like broken down. Um, there is some manual stuff our trainers will do um, with their hands to make sure we're going right into that recovery process. Um, but... Um, when even, even my time at Radford, we had gone right into, okay, heavy weighted ball stuff, reverse throws, mm-hmm. okay, all kinds of stuff, bands, making sure we're moving, all that kind of, but like that shoulder capsule is already so beat up that there is no point, like, let's, let's, let's make sure the body is getting into the proper recovery state. That's, that should be our number one goal because we need to maximize recovery. Okay. Um, what, cause whether it's in high school, whether it's in college, whether it's in summer ball, these guys are throwing nonstop. Mm-hmm. And we need to make sure we maximize that recovery time. Okay. And then the next day, would that consist of you? You said that you used to do like flush runs. Uh, yeah. Is, is that still a thing with even just sprints or anything like that the next day? Um, it's a little bit of a heavier load with sprints. Um, but again, it also depends on the depends on the athlete. Sure. Um, um, that's that's one key thing as well. Um, I will be honest. We. The great thing about pro ball is that stuff is segmented out to to another person, so mm-hmm. that's not an area that I'm, I'm I'm too familiar with. Like I know the general baseline of what we do on a daily basis, but the exact exercises um, are are kind of uh, foreign in a sense. Um, but I know the long runs are out. It's it's more of uh, understanding workload, understanding volume um, within that sprint dynamic. Mm-hmm. I so like those that. power positions, understanding of the recovery, understanding, okay, we're going to taper down the workload and increase the intensity as we get closer to, to game day, to pitch day. I like that. I like that. And something that you've got a lot of, of stuff now that you're in pro ball, which is a luxury, is data. And <laughs> so I, I'm sure we could spend an entire show on just what you guys are looking for, what you got. But I, I really want to know, so, you, so you've got all of this data. How do you – simplify it in a way that makes sense to the player and 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 i'm sure there that the more and the longer that we get into this the more that they'll be as well versed as we are in what that data looks Mm -hmm. like and you see some guys that are already uh, in that but for the most part you got a an array of guys who of education and of different languages so how what's the best way that you go okay so taking this rap soto data or taking this trackman data uh, and breaking it down to letting a player know what his strengths are and, and, and blending that with the, with what the player is feeling. Yeah. So <laughs> this is, I love, I love this part of, of, uh, being in professional baseball. The data we have access to is absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, and also being around some of the smartest people you're ever going to meet in the baseball world helps, helps a lot. Um, the amount of learning that can go on. Um, but like you said, there's a lot of this stuff is foreign to everybody. It's all new. It's all, Oh, Nerds are ruining baseball, stuff like that. No, we're like it go, comes down to we're trying to maximize these guys' abilities. Sure. Um, and, and I think it was Bannister. There's a quote from the new baseball book that Bannister put out, um, and I firmly, firmly, firmly believe in. Like this is like the epitome of of what I of my pitching philosophy um, is. I would rather have a guy with an 80 grade pitch and no command than a guy with a 40, 50 grade pitch with phenomenal command. Mm-hmm. 
um, because hitters hit average. We need to maximize what these guys already do well and get them to ends of the spectrum. Okay. Okay. There are going to be guys that are average. They have to be perfect every time out. But if you're a guy with a Chapman fastball, okay, that's a different world. Mm-hmm. You can have an off day and still go and dominate. Um, and it's about understanding and getting players to understand why that matters so much. Okay. Um, the biggest thing I look at, um, first of all, the, the, the number one stat I look at is strike percentage. Um, because the ultimate goal is to end the at bat with every pitch. Mm-hmm. That is the ultimate goal for every pitcher as soon as they step on the mound. Okay. Um, and over an, a big enough sample size, over enough pitches, we can generally tell, okay, this pitcher throws a strike, strike percentage at 60%. This guy throws strikes at 70%. Mm-hmm. That's going to dictate a lot about when he throws strikes. Okay. Um, you're gonna, like, again, a pitcher steps on the mound, their number one goal is to throw a strike. They're not trying to throw balls. Mm-hmm. Um, and so especially they don't when. Throw strikes. Yeah, I, that's, that's <laughs> like, they, they're trying. Like, I, again, I was one of those guys. I wasn't a very good baseball player. I'll be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I was trying to throw strikes every time I touched the mound. Okay. I just didn't have the ability to. I didn't have a big enough strike strike percentage. So, um, yeah, you, you as a high school coach, you as a college coach, sitting there and yell, throw strikes. The kid is trying to. Right. Um, now it's about you understanding, okay, how can I help him better do that? Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, the first place I go to is strike percentage. Okay, Are we getting too granular sometimes looking at the other numbers? Maybe. Okay, Usually you're going to have a better – First pitch strike percentage if you throw more strikes. Mm-hmm. That's generally going to happen. If you're throwing at 70% clip, you're probably going to have a relatively high first pitch strike percentage. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the first place I go and, and help the players understand. Like, okay, like you're throwing, you're throwing overall 70% strikes, but you're throwing all your strikes in two ball counts. What is your intent those first couple pitches? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to nibble? Are you afraid of contact? Like, no, let's go right at these guys. Let's end the at-bat right now. Mm-hmm. Or – are you throwing a lot of pitches with two strikes? Like, are you nibbling then? Are you trying to expand? Are you trying to get to the chase? No. Yeah. Go at them in the zone and the at-bat right now. That's right. that's the ultimate goal. Um, and then we also, like, being in a professional organization, we have access to some numbers that, that, that you guys, the general population, doesn't really have. Um, you can see them if you're on fan graphs with big leaguers and stuff like that, but the expected numbers, in my opinion, are huge. Mm-hmm. Um the expected numbers essentially take your exit velocity and your launch angle, okay, and they predict, okay, in the last five years, this has gone as a double typically. So it, it essentially evaluates the contact that pitchers are giving up. And this is huge for me because that is the ultimate goal. The, sorry, the ultimate goal is swing and miss, mm-hmm. and then after that, it's soft contact. Sure. If a, if a guy gets a, 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 a fister over first base that goes for a triple – you should not be credited. You should not. That guy should not be credited with a triple. Mm-hmm. Okay, that is soft contact. Generally, that is going to go as an out. Sure. Okay, it just so happened that it found the right spot on the right fi- on the field mm-hmm. and and sliced down the line. Sure. Um, but if you're giving up uh, 110 miles per hour at 15 degree, and that the the left fielder is just standing on the warning track, and he happens to be there, you mm-hmm. should get. You should. That guy should get credit for a triple or a double. Like that's that's some serious contact. <laughs> yeah. We are rating the contact that you are giving up, right. um, because again, the ultimate goal is swing and miss. After that, okay, are we giving up soft contact? Because mm-hmm. singles aren't going to beat us. Right. Um, if we look at the throughout the history of baseball, okay, uh, the balls that are put in play go for hits thirty percent of the time. Mm-hmm. Okay. If we're giving up soft contact, those are going as singles. If we're giving up hard contact. Those are going as doubles and triples. Right. Okay. And we don't, we get beat by doubles and triples. We get beat by the extra base hits. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, it's, it's kind of the role of defense to take away the singles. And it's the role of the pitcher to, to take away the doubles, the triples and the home runs. Right. All and right. that's where, that's where even the running game comes in so far in managing the running game. If, mm-hmm. if I, if I as a pitcher give up a single, I cannot give up a double in a sense, by letting that guy get on second base. Mm-hmm. That's where managing that running, running game is so important. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. And, and another thing that I, I think that would be really hard for pitching coaches in general, especially on your level, is the difference between experimenting with some different stuff because every pitcher mm-hmm. that I've ever come in contact to has like 17 pitches, right? <laughs> and deciding whether, whether or not and, – and data has made that easier – 
But at the same time, it may make guys want to experiment with some different grips and then trying to get comfortable with that. And so what's the fine line between, okay, well, let's experiment with some different grips and maybe you not might not be comfortable, but let's look at your spin, spin rate and let's look at how it moves versus let's get really good at one or two or three pitches maybe, and then we can work out from there if we need to. So what's the balance between that? Um, again, it's just kind of like where do you lie on the spectrum? Okay. Um, where are you in the spectrum of pitches in general? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of where you have to, as a coach, you got to like, you have to be honest with the guy. Like, hey, this is where you're at right now. This is kind of in the scope of the grand scheme. And Rapsodo has done a great job with making sure those numbers are relatively available where, where MLB averages are. And again, that's not, people don't understand. That's not the general population average. That's mm-hmm. the best of baseball average. Sure. Okay. So that is the highest scale we can possibly go to. Um, and making sure we, we understand, understand those numbers and, and okay, where does your pitch lie in the grand scheme of things? Mm-hmm. Is it on either end of that scale or is it kind of just sitting kind of floating in the middle? Mm-hmm. Um, if it's floating in the middle, we need to experiment. We need to try some new things. Sure. Okay. Because, if, again, I've, I've said it before. If you're average, you have to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Okay, when you have when you have end of the spectrum stuff, okay, that's when we can we can have some fun, even on days you're not you're not on. Okay, um, so yeah, it's just and, and that's a hard message for to sometimes deliver. Um, is hey, your your stuff's not great, but we need to we need to get it better. We're here to get it better. We're here to maximize what you're already good at. Mm-hmm. Um, and and. Sometimes it's hard for players to hear that. But again, if you're honest with them and you're open with them and you show them kind of the information that's available to you, like why why are you why are we trying to change you? Um, usually, they're more receptive to it. Oh, I like that a lot, and uh, I think that that uh, you know we we swing a bat and we throw pitches uh, since we're five years old, right? And so <laughs> some of the patterns that we have, we've grown accustomed to. I'm really comfortable doing this. Why would I want to change that? So I, I think that. That absolutely has to be a conversation that you have with them, and I think you hit the nail on the head with how you explained that. But before we go, I've got a couple of lightning style questions for you. And so the first one is, what's the latest thing learned that's gotten you really excited? Um, again, really di- diving into this uh, kinesiology aspect, um, understanding how the body moves, understanding how the body works, understanding how we can use and leverage what a pitcher already does um, very well in terms of the way they move. Um, again, I can't stress enough how key that is to, okay. to understanding even pitch design. Okay. This guy physically cannot do this. So we're just going to grind something down if we try to make him do this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's, that's huge. So again, you going to eight on base, you, or, um, I did TPI this off season and went to, went out to Cressy and then having worked with a guy like Travis Kuhn and, and our athletic trainer, David LaCroix, they just continue to educate me on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And again, Look at Wes Johnson, our big league pitching coach. Guy has a uh, uh, kinesiology background. Right. Um, there's something to say of, about that. I love that. What about something that you guys do either in training or in practice or you know spring training, whatever it is? What's something that you guys do that your players love, or like maybe something competitive or just something that you guys do on a daily basis? Um, and this is this is kind of interesting because we had a little bit of a, a fight at it first um or, or some some negative feedback um differential balls okay. guys are a big fan of them um the driveline differential balls different sizes different weights mm-hmm. they'll grab them and just play, play catch with them something is easy that some guys will get on the mountain and throw them some guys will just play long toss with them because they just want to feel something different mm-hmm. different in their hand um yeah that's that's kind of it's been really interesting to watch that kind of relationship with with those balls kind of develop and grow those are hard by the way those are really hard to throw for strikes those those are very hard to throw for strikes, <laughs> especially like the the larger one that's overload, and then the really small one that's under, the little, little small one that's underload. I cannot like I I can't even play catch with it. I throw it into the ground every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah, so it is uh, hard. It's very hard. No, no doubt, no doubt. What about what are some of your favorite resources? I know you've mentioned Driveline and Cressy and Alan Jager a couple of different times, but what are some other different resources or books that have shaped your coaching career? Um, that's tough. I'm a, I'm a pretty, pretty avid reader. Okay. Um, really, really enjoy books, really enjoy learning. Um, the best thing any of anybody in your audience, and if they're, if they're listening to this podcast, they're probably doing it already is sit there and listen on Twitter. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and watch Twitter and, and watch what these coaches are putting out. And I'll be the first, um, I'll be honest with you, this is very much outside of my comfort zone talking mm -hmm. and, and doing some, doing a podcast like this. And, and I need to do a better job of putting information out, but that's where someone like Andrew Wright and his staff do a phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. um, follow the guys on ABCA follow like there's these, there's this little, like not, I don't want to say cult cult's a bad word, but there's a group of coaches that do a phenomenal job of putting out information um, to help the, the baseball population get better. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll, again, if, if there are people in your audience that, that want more information, um, don't be afraid to, to, to message myself again. I don't do a very good job at promoting myself and I, this is very much inside my comfort zone, but mm -hmm. if so, I, I'm an open book, if somebody wants to, um, ask me something or dive deeper with something, I'm an open book. They can reach out to me and, and, and contact me. Um, but again, Twitter is probably the best thing you can do in creating relationships with those, those coaches on Twitter, okay. uh, will help you in a big way. No doubt. No doubt. That's, and that's one of the big, big reasons I started this is because I, I started following coaches on Twitter, realized that I am way behind a lot of people and I just wanted to learn as much as I can from guys like yourself. But you said, uh, for them to reach out to you, what's the best way to do so? Um, my Twitter, uh, I, I think I have an Instagram. It's kind of just there for show. Um, <laughs> but my Twitter is, my Twitter is, uh, uh at just Willard two, I believe. Yeah, uh, we'll link it down in the show. Notes. So yeah, 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 that's it. And, um, yeah, just reach out to me. Um, again, I, I'm, I'm an open book. I don't, I don't self self promote in a sense. Like I won't be posting a lot of stuff, but if you ask me a question, I will come out and answer and I will give you everything I know. I'm a, I just want to continue to develop and grow this kind of baseball community and, and help other coaches grow and help myself grow. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just going to open up the mic for you and just ask, is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? I think again, if you boil down this whole player development process, you can't just look at one sphere. It is a, um, it is an organism that has many moving facets, um, and associating yourself or familiar, familiarizing yourself because again, not a lot of like you have seven coaches, but probably have one athletic trainer, mm -hmm. um, and maybe have a strength coach to deal with all those, all those players. Um, so it's tough. It's putting a lot of burden on them, but educate yourself and try to educate yourself as much as you can on those different facets and how the kind of that interplay works.